This video will cover some of my favorite books for students, really anyone that has an interest in math, science, technology, and engineering. For those who just want the list, look in the description. Otherwise, let's get into it. Number one is The Physics of the Future, which I loved because it covered a very broad range of topics from computers, artificial intelligence, and nanotechnology to medicine, fusion power, and space travel. The book covers specific areas of research that are of importance to our future to give you some insight on actual projects out there, such as nanoparticles that can seek out cancer cells being worked on at Argonne National Lab where they have made prototypes several years ago, or internet glasses and contact lenses being worked on by several companies to make augmented reality become more widely used. This author also released a book recently on the future of humanity which I have not read yet but likely will. Other books you'd enjoy that I would recommend include Soonish and Rise of the Robots if this one interests you. One complaint I have about how college teaches us, especially when it comes to STEM fields, is they take a very bottom-up approach. They teach us how transistors work, which lie within our computers, or how much thrust various types of rocket fuels can provide. Which of course is important, don't get me wrong, but even if you know all that stuff, you don't know what new technologies are emerging, or the big problems facing a certain field, and what scientists, engineers, and so on are doing to resolve them, or how different fields affect each other, such as how making room temperature superconductors that can act as super strong magnets would allow for frictionless electron flow, meaning easier and cheaper delivery of power to our homes, which is something I discussed in a video on this book. School does teach some of that stuff, but in my opinion they could do a better job in giving us a high level picture of everything. But the good news is you can learn a lot of this on your own. Next up is Algorithms to Live By, The Computer Science of Human Decisions, which is great for anyone interested in computer science, math slash mathematical algorithms, statistics, and especially how they all come together to solve various problems in the world of computer science, but also our everyday lives. In the first chapter, the author explains a mathematical puzzle known as the secretary problem. To simplify this, let's say you're going to interview 100 people for a secretary position and you want to hire the best one, and there's only one best person for the job of that 100, and you have no idea who it is. And to add to this, after each interview you have to either hire them, thus ending your search, or tell them they did not get the job and you'll never see them again. What would be the optimum way to approach this to hire the best of the 100 candidates? Well, if you hired the first person you interviewed because you liked them, that'd be a very bad move. It assumes the other 99 are not as good, which is not very likely. If you wait till, let's say, the 90th interview to pick someone, it's likely you already passed the best person. Well, the algorithm for this problem is to interview 37 people and then pick the next best one that's better than all the previous 37. Using this algorithm, you will pick the best candidate of the 100 37% of the time. So it does fail 63% of the time, but even if you interviewed a million people, it would still work 37% of the time, which is not bad. If you tried to do this on your own, you would likely fail to pick the best person way more times. This is known as optimal stopping, where you can't always go back after making a decision. And this can apply to looking for a parking spot, picking an apartment, or choosing to marry someone. And that 37% shows up in these types of problems, although we did have to assume a few things about the situation to simplify it. And that's just one topic of the book, where he breaks down these concepts in computer science first, then shows how they apply in a real-world setting. The author talks about sorting algorithms that computers use and how we could use them to sort a stack of books or list of numbers as efficiently as possible. There's overfitting in the idea of using too many parameters to fit data points to the point of being overly complex and actually losing accuracy. Or how if you're at a casino playing various slot machines, and you play one, let's say, 10 times, and you win 8 of those but lose 2. That's pretty good, of course, but based on a few other parameters I won't explain now, it can be more beneficial for you to try a machine you have not played yet. Because there's value in the unknown when it's completely possible another machine will pay out better. You will see this in the section on the Gittins Index and Explore slash Exploit Methods, which the author explains. And of course there's plenty more on how computer science concepts that are used in mathematical and statistical problems can apply to our everyday lives, but it lays a great foundation. The next book is a little different, and that is A Mind for Numbers, which I've talked about many times, but had to include. This is about how to excel in math and science, but really can apply to any subject. It's more about how to learn. The author talks about the two different modes of learning, focused and diffuse mode, and how you have to go in and out of both of them to achieve true mastery of a subject. She reveals illusions of learning, how to prevent procrastination, and much more. I have made a video on this book, so I'll end with that quick summary. One book out there for math lovers is How Not to Be Wrong, The Power of Mathematical Thinking, which is one of my favorite books hands down. 
It talks about a lot of subjects from geometry, computer science, gambling, and statistics, to the military and politics, but everything is discussed from a more mathematical standpoint. Such as how out of the 50 states, South Dakota has the highest percentage of people with brain cancer. But assumptions as to why are usually wrong. The reason is actually because of the law of large numbers, and how the lower population of the state allows for more fluctuations in percentages, whether it comes to brain cancer or those who love a certain type of movie. If you flip a coin twice, it's decently likely you'll get 100% heads. But if you flip that same coin 100 times, it's extremely unlikely you'll get 100% heads. Lower flips means more fluctuation in the percentage of some outcome, just like lower population states, smaller groups, smaller sample sizes, and so on. Or another cool example from the book is if you ask people to guess the outcome of five flips of a coin, they might guess something like heads, tails, tails, heads, tails, or something. But if you asked a thousand people this question, you'd find very few people would guess this or this, all heads or all tails even though an outcome of all heads is equally as likely as this outcome here. People don't feel like these two are random. They feel like these must mean something is maybe staged or wrong with a coin. But it's true that this guess would be way underrepresented. This means when people think they're being random, they might not be. And years ago, two students analyzed the results of a presidential election in Iran where one candidate won by a large amount only to find that the total votes amassed by the four candidates did not have an even distribution in their final digits. It wasn't evenly distributed from 0 to 9, which wasn't proof but pointed them in the direction that the outcome was fixed as many people thought. Moving on, on a separate but important topic when it comes to productivity, my favorite book is Deep Work by Cal Newport. Cal Newport has a PhD in computer science and discusses the type of work needed to thrive in our society and how to operate efficiently when we are surrounded by constant distractions. He discusses how he gets more done than many others while having the same amount of time or even less. Most people are doing the wrong type of work that requires hours of time to complete the same task as using deep work to complete a task. If you want some good motivation and tangible advice to get things done, this book is for you. He also has many other books on how to excel in school that you may enjoy as well. And lastly, I didn't think this video would be complete without including the biography of Elon Musk. For anyone looking to learn more about his life, how much he had to go through to get where he is, or any entrepreneurs looking for motivation, this is a great read. It reveals a lot about how his companies started out, and also some of the engineering behind the technologies within those companies, but there's also parts on his family life, money situations, and of course more. There are many more books I'd recommend, but I wanted to keep this video short and just give some recommendations. As I read more, I'll keep updating you guys on ones I would recommend. Otherwise, if you like this video, don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe, and I'll see you all next time.